you want to start? Hello, everybody, and welcome to. I'm just checking. The, is, is Drew ready to go? I don't know. I don't. Let me. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> go. Oh, I feel like I've been interrupted. No. Hello, Sorry. everybody, and welcome to the Chip Watch Podcast. Um, it is very exciting to be here. My name is Ethan. This is Joel, and we are joined this week uh, by Drew. Hello. Hello. Andrew welcome. or Drew? Drew. I'm only Andrew, Drew. and I'm in trouble. Okay. From yep. your mum. Yeah. Okay. Basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dumped her in it already. Yeah. yeah nice. <laughs> Excellent. Well, welcome to welcome to the Chipmunk Podcast. And the way we like to get to know you is we ask a very important question. And that is, how do you like your hot chips? Oh, this is an excellent question because I consider myself to be a little bit of a chip connoisseur. Oh, I, like mm-hmm. when, I like it when some people say that when they come on the podcast. That's it. That's yep. it. Now, I've found that there are usually two types of people. There's the people who just come in and they squirt sauce or gravy and mm. then they dig in and it becomes a mushy mess and that's fine for them. Me, on the other hand, I'm one of those people that loves like seasoning and loves different things. So I like, you know, your Himalayan pink salt with mm. uh, mixed herbs and rosemary mm. doused in it. Or, and this is a personal favourite, very English, um, salt and vinegar. Yes, mm. wow. Yes. I have a very few cool. people with English mm. backgrounds yes. who say that. Yeah, yep. and, and a great one to try is also paprika. Paprika and mm. chips. Did you say paprika? No. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Paprika. <laughs> paprika. paprika. It just gives that lovely little spicy edge to it. And oh, it's just awesome. like all of a sudden you just, it's, you're a chip monster. It's chips. It's, yeah. <laughs> so are you no sauce then, or you put sauce on the side and dip? Um, I like certain sauces actually. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I actually don't mind chips and sauce. Mm-hmm. It's just that I like a bit of diversity in that in that area, and I would prefer to not have the same approach every time. It just gets mm-hmm. a bit boring otherwise yeah. for me. Nothing. So I like mixing it up and you know trying different things. And no pap- paprika sauce. Pap- paprika. Yeah. Paprika. Oh, paprika. <laughs> I feel like that's a great brand Arriba. actually. Paprika. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pap- Paprika, paprika, paprika. <laughs> Say it five times. Ooh. Yeah, that's right. No thanks. <laughs> it's like, yeah, paprika, paprika. Your favorite paprika, made by your papa, with an extra spice, made by your papa. <laughs> and the brand could be mamas. <laughs> ah, yes. Amazing. Amazing. That Amazing. seems good. Yeah, that's like the next brand, the yeah. next uh, product. Yeah, yeah. we've yeah. solved it. Amazing. Uh, any particular place that you like to get your chips, or like. Some things I like. Sometimes I like to ask people if they have a memory, like a childhood memory, about hot chips. Any, any, anything in regards to that? Good question. My grandfather used to get me fish and chip chips um, mm. from Bondi because that's where he lived, mm. and we used to sit on the beach and eat them. And that was a very fond memory. So I can remember that at three and four, sort of oh, sitting there it. eating <coughs> with uh, with pop. Um, my favourite place to get them is often burger shops. I find mm. that burger shops have a great appreciation of chips. Because they add to the burger. Don't oh, they? 100%. Yeah. yeah. A good burger and a good set of chips and, you know, oh, man, mm. like it's it's all over. I'm mm. done for the night. So. And they are better together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think. <coughs> Did you notice there's no mention of chicken salt? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll Paprika is a much cooler... Pa- paprika. Paprika. The, much cool the there thing. is a thing on the podcast that we have that when uh, between myself, Braden, and Ethan, where Braden and Ethan think that chicken salt is far superior to regular salt, and Ooh. I don't even like to call it regular salt because it's actually just salt. But um, yeah, I keep getting outvoted on chicken salt over normal salt, mm. which is upsetting. And I'm not dead against chicken salt, but I'm just like, you know what? I, d- I think I've... Rem- I really? Re- you I were definitely dead against it no, for a long time. No, and I'm not fully... I am more against it than others. Right. But I realised where my dislike... This week, I realised where my dislike of chicken salt came from, which is when I used to go to AMF bowling mm. and actually bowled in competition, even though I was terrible. <laughs> but... <laughs> Big Lebowski over here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was a f- it was fun, but you could get hot chips from the place, and they would put so much chicken salt on it that yeah. it was it was almost inedible. Note note that it's not a burger place. Good point. I think that's a really important thing. That's a like point. I think if you're basing whether you like chips or not from AMF bowling, no, it's I the think, chicken no, salt. No, that's thing. what I mean. Like I just like that experience. Mm. I don't think is. The ideal. A lot of formative experiences are like that, though. You have a bad experience, and it's from a place where you shouldn't have what you've got, mm-hmm. and just ruins. The it. reason I'm not a fan of dogs is because I was riding my bike when I was eight years old, 
in the neighbor's front yard. He had a path. He allowed mm-hmm. us to do it. Mm-hmm. And a large Dalmatian ran up behind me, Dalmatian. jumped on my back and pulled me off my bike. That's wow. why I don't like dogs. Was it trying to be your friend or was it like aggressive? I think it was just excited. Yeah, right. Mm. But um, it was a very large Dalmatian. Dalmatians are huge. Yeah. They're, the They're really big. Not there. I mean, it was one of them. But <laughs> <laughs> it was, just wasn't there. Yeah. Maybe you ate more than 400. <laughs> that's why it was so big. <laughs> um, Amazing. Yes, anyway, I didn't see Corella either. Oh. <laughs> Good. Uh, speaking of formative experiences. Oh, um, segue. Thank you. Thank you. for here all week. Uh, Drew, yeah. uh, how did you become a Christian? Good question. Um, is, I every, is all of our questions good questions? Because I like the sound of this if going forward with the podcast. Also, we've only got three. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. Uh, I, I, I think I have a bad habit of doing that. <laughs> so I apologize <laughs> in advance. But, no, um, it's the, it, it's no, no, I feel it's, great about no, it. No, it's yeah. actually a fantastic, thoughtful strategy of just like, give me a moment to think. And while yeah, I. It's a, sto- a bit of a storm. Yeah, it's a bit of a storm. Yep. Really and and mm. what you've actually done is stalled enough for me to think through my response, which is. We got you. Very well helpful. That's Thank it. You. That's it. All right. Um, so the, <clears throat> the good and the long story of it is I grew up in a uh, culturally Christian family. My parents, I don't know their relationship with the Lord, but my assumption is they they don't walk with him. Mm. Um, my brother spent some time going to a, a church for a bit, but but has not been seen there since the, uh, well, the early 2000s, I think is probably the right response to that, maybe even earlier, late 90s. Um, and my younger brother never really had an interest in it. So I was a, uh, the more unusual one in that, um, as I was going to church at um, a place called St. Thomas's in Kingsgrove, um, I got uh, baptised and, um, what's the word? Um, confirmed? Confirmed. <laughs> yeah, I've done bubble training. Um, <laughs> got confirmed at, um, at St. Thomas's, uh, which was a good experience. And I feel like that had an, an impact on me. A, a guy called Ken Tolk was quite formative in my uh, walk there. Uh, but even as young as a young kid in primary school, I still remember having deep moments of thought at school where I'm like, what happens when you die? Hmm. What happens, you know, what happens after then? Because I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around the concept of it stopping. Hmm. I just, that there's, there's this block in my brain that at death and at the stopping, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Like the, that there's obviously some drive to, to go further and see further. So that's always sort of been a part of my life forming up. And then um, I changed schools. I went to a, a Catholic school for um, high school um, and ended up ironically in St Mary's Cathedral and I still remember having um, quite uh, vivid debates or um, enthusiastic debates with many of the Catholics there and even though I wasn't really attending church I still couldn't wrap my head around the theology of Catholicism which has been a bit of a um, an epic battle for me um, and then towards the end of uh, my high school period I started to go to church and uh, that was interesting Um, so I went to a youth group and I went to a church and I think I had a better understanding of it and I could begin to to learn a little bit more about what it was to be a Christian but it was still a very juvenile understanding of it Um, I turned 18 and um, promptly walked myself away from things as I think some people do and spent I suppose you'd call them wilderness years where um, I didn't really uh, walk with the Lord. And then strangely, it was when I was at uh, Maya, I was working at Maya during university and uh, there was a, a young lass who I had an eye for over in uh, children's and women's wear who I started to get to know. <laughs> and uh, in the process of that, discovered that awesome. she was a Christian and she would uh, absolutely not do anything further than have a coffee with me until I decided to go to church. And... Awesome. Uh, you know, being the, the typical guy, I said, yeah, sure, I'll come along to church and didn't work out with a girl, uh, but I kept the church, so to speak. So <laughs> I, I married the church um, and I rocked up at St. John's Anglican in Sutherland and spent quite a number of years there uh, being taught, learning. Uh, that was really, really good. Uh, I think I came a long way in that, that part of it, but I think that the real real moment where I fully understand the gospel and it's it's interesting right so was going to church for a number of years very dedicated to the idea of it you know two three years heard a heard a sermon by a guy called Tim Keller on the what he called the prodigal god and understood 
he, he explained and I understood what he was explaining um, in the terms of the gospel being it's not what you do that's bad necessarily, it's also what you do that's good, which is bad. And that idea that we're, we've all fallen short um, and we all sin and our motivations behind that sin um, are fairly consistent even when the outcome is good um, or bad. And that blew my mind. I mm-hmm. think I spent probably the next six to 12 months uh, feverishly listening to sermons where I understood the gospel mm-hmm. for the first time. And I think that was quite um, a paradigm shift. That was very monumental for me. I went, actually, I get it. Mm-hmm. I finally get it. Um, and it went away from you just do good things to no, no, there's a genuine relationship effort here from y- your deity, mm-hmm. um, which is Jesus coming down to, to earth to meet with us. And um, he's trying to tell us that it doesn't matter what we do, we never get there. And in fact, there's a problem with the heart. Mm. And um, I think that was quite powerful because it started to answer a lot of the questions that I think we as people ask ourselves is, why do I do this? A lot that I reckon everyone has an internal dialogue that goes on, um, Christian or non-Christian. Why am I doing this? Why did, why did I do that? Why? And I think it started to answer a lot of those questions for me that there was actual, um, there was an issue with my heart and it kept pushing me to do things that were negative, that were unhelpful, that exhibited sin, which is that breakdown of a relationship. Um, and that, that really helped me because all of a sudden looking back on why I did things that I was either ashamed of or didn't think was helpful or even I was proud of, I could start to go, hang on, there's something underneath all that that was driving me. Mm. It was really, really helpful for me to hear um, all that sort of teaching. So, How old were you at that point, do you reckon? So I would have been 24, 25, and I'd been going to church for about th- two to three years before, like committed Christian mm. attendance, yeah. um, which is odd in one sense because you assume that someone who's going to church for two to three years knows and understands the gospel and in fact i think one of the things i've discovered is there's a lot of people who sit in the pews that sometimes don't get it and it's not that they're dumb and it's not that they're (laughs) deliberately Mm. ignoring it it's that fully their heart hasn't hasn't sprung it asunder and Mm. understood the gospel Mm. And do you reckon that you, you spoke about that moment listening to the Tim Keller sermon? Do you think you were looking? You're like, I'm still missing something, or was just you hadn't realised? No, he just blew my mind. <laughs> like literally, just blew my mind yeah, and my right. heart. And 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 it was hearing him, hearing him very proficiently um, expound the gospel um, in an exegetical way, in a very convincing way, um, in a very relatable way, mm. like. Uh, it was a, it was actually it was a Willow Creek sermon that he gave to, back when Willow Creek uh, conferences were a thing, and um, <clears throat> there were two guys that were on. One of them was Harvey Carey, who I I still listen to every now and then, and one of them was Tim Keller. And Harvey Carey came on. He's like, I asked to be put on after the lunch because I'm your your gospel cappuccino or espresso, and basically his his energy when he got up on stage <laughs> was just dynamic. And he, he we watched that, and then we watched Tim Keller's one, and true to his form. Harvey woke you up and then kind of Tim slam dunked it afterwards. It was yeah, just cool. brilliant in that sense. So, um, but yeah, I, I remember listening to it. It was at, it was at um, Guy Mere, um the Tradies. And oh, yeah. oh, it cool. was on a St. John's like leadership retreat thing. And, and I still remember sitting there walking out going, my, my entire life has just been like overturned in, in yeah. one fell swoop. Yeah, I think of all the stories that we've had on Chipotle, so I don't think we've had one like this, which is quite interesting. And th- that doesn't mean that you're any different to the rest of mm. us. I just think I think that's really fascinating to see how God works in other ways. And like, sorry, the one similarity though is that we have a lot of people. I mean, it includes me. It's like even before they become Christians, there's like, oh, there's something else. You know, you were talking about mm. like what happens when you're after, when you after you die and all these kind of things. There's like God is like like whispering or calling to you and just it just chooses the moment when you yep. need to like as you said like your heart springs asunder which is really mm. really fascinating 
there's a great image in um uh, I think it's uh where I think it's in Jeremiah or Ezekiel, I can't remember where again I've done bubble training. Um <laughs> where Elijah's on the mountain and he, he hears the two the thunder and the the, the lightning and then it, there's the whisper on the wind. Mm. Um and and quite often I think God works like that, the whisper on the wind where mm. there's this little silent voice sitting very patiently waiting for the right moments to speak into. Mm. Um, and that is, that they're the profound moments. I think they're the ones where people are vulnerable. When people are vulnerable, things happen. Mm. Um, which is, you know, really a challenging thing for anyone to be is vulnerable. I think mm, in a world yeah. which drives resilience or, it's, you know, drives, you know, do, do this and be yeah. strong and have courage, you know, to be vulnerable is actually really hard. Yeah. I think, how much do you think that, like, you going to Catholic school and stuff influenced that? Uh, that isn't to give um, Catholics a hard time. No, I'm no. Just, I'm just saying, I, that I wonder if that did or didn't. My experience has been, and sort of, I, I've talked to, to Tina about her, her experience, and I hope I'm not talking out of turn with that. But Your wife, she, your wife Tina. Yeah, mm-hmm. my wife, Tina. She, she grew up and um, <laughs> went to a, a Christian school, and I think, very early on made a decision to walk with God. And I think the Christian school helped with that. And I think, um, you know, true Catholic who grew up in the system and, and believed it would, it would still be helpful. I actually think though that it, it's about different stages. So um, certain people will, will have that moment of enlightenment when they're a child, when they're a school age kid. Um, I know that it didn't influence me at all in terms of um, it didn't make sense to me. I struggled with the um, the religiosity of it. And again, that's that's part of me as a person. Mm. I'm a bit anti-establishment in, in many senses. Um, Just like the rituals and things like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. the rituals don't don't gel with me. Right. Um, the, the long services, which are not like... I suppose user focused and, and again I know it's not about the user but like when you're sitting there and the pew is breaking your back and you don't understand what they're saying and they're doing weird things and they're wearing weird clothes and you just sit there and you go how is this at all part of my life mm. um, and you know having now read a lot about why they do many of the things they do I get why they do them and there's there's purpose and meaning behind them and mm. that's fine but I think there's there's something that I'm very passionate about, which is contextualization, and it's about taking something and helping people understand the meaning of it. Mm. I think potentially their challenge is that they they simply don't contextualize what they're doing. Um, they don't contextualize their message. That there are some people that you know a more um, formal appreciation of God works for them. Um, you know, and, and that's fine. Um, it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> um, if I can't wear thongs to a service in summer, um, I have to check out because, <laughs> you know, ain't nobody got time for that. So um, I don't know, Stu's on my side with that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about you? Fa- welcome here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What about your family, though? Like, because you were saying they're, they were, you were, they're culturally Christian and then you went to a Catholic school, but then you like started going to a church, like following a girl there. But then, like you started going to St John's at Selland, what are they thinking if you gone to church um, regularly? They, I don't think they really mind. Mum, mum, I think likes the idea of having a a good boy, mm. and I think she sees church as kind of shaping good moral behaviors. boy, yeah, mm. good yeah. moral boy. Um, so I think in that sense, she she doesn't really mind. Dad certainly has no objections either way that they're, they're not um they're not anti-christian which is fine um wh- where it becomes difficult is when so i did a year in tonga doing some mission work when mm. i was over there and mum don't, didn't understand that why do you have to go there for so long um that idea of allowing something to drive your life that mm. didn't fit in her worldview was a huge challenge because mum like it is a bit of a mother duck likes to keep her kids close um and i'm the type of person that likes to wander Mm. and 
go on an adventure <laughs> and come back mm. per se. Um, which is ironic now because I can't do any of those things because of work and life and family <laughs> and responsibility. But um, I've always found that unless you, unless there's a level of freedom to seek out what I feel is um, what should drive my life, um, I shut down quite quite badly. Mm. Like I don't I don't flourish as a human being. Um, and what my most freest moments have been when I've been pursuing things with God as the core, mm-hmm. like um, whether that is raising my family to try and know who God is, but raise them in an environment that I know God wants them to be in, which is um, often very difficult in a secular society, um, whether that is um, pursuing um, business in a Christian manner. Mm-hmm. So like in the business that I run, doing things the right way and doing things with a degree of integrity that I believe should be done um those things are what drive me and make me feel free yeah. um they're the that, that those set of rules set me free so to speak um whereas i think mum has a different set of rules which is you just got to sort of sit in your box and do your nine to five and blah 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 this is a security like, kind of thing yeah and yeah and i'm just like there's no security in the world like <laughs> there, there's no like you know, this there's, segue. Not hun- there's no 100 percent security, right? No, 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 no. And there's probably I mean, levels, but there's not 100. percent Yeah, there's 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 certain things that are more sure than others, and that's all probability based. Yeah. Um, but to me, I've discovered that nothing is certain, and tomorrow, bang, lose your job, lose your house, lose your family, whatever. Mm. Any of those things could happen through some weird curveball, and the sooner people, I think, understand that. Um, that's the environment we live in, the more people begin to think. Mm. And that's that's a really powerful thing for everyone, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. And you, you said that, um, you mentioned uni just before then. What were you doing at uni? <laughs> not not uni work. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I spent more time in the uni bar playing pool um, than I probably did in lectures. And in fact, me and my mates would routinely slip out the back door of a three-hour lecture at the start as the old overheads had gotten warmed up and we'd return with about seven minutes to spare. Oh, the overheads were all oh, yeah. <laughs> um, And I liked that in terms of I had no interest in the a lot of the conversations that were going on because they weren't challenging, but mm. building relationships with my mates was. Mm. Um, so I did, I did a business um, and commerce degree and I, I majored in marketing and management, I think it was. And I attribute that with um, helping me to learn to think a bit better because I think Mm. at school it's very prescriptive. You must do the syllabus, learn the syllabus, walk out. Mm. Um, Whereas I found uni more around the idea of what do you think? And I found that refreshing. Mm -hmm. Um, So towards the end of the three year, I was more interested in the talk just because the lecturers got more advanced. Mm. Uh, The start was just like a rehash of school and I was was like not interested at all. Um, I got out of that. <laughs> um, I was very happy to leave school. Mm. So, yeah. What uni were you at? Western Sydney, down in Campbelltown. Yes, UWS Campbelltown. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Absolutely. Take that, UOW. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> I did a business and commerce degree too. There you go. But in sports management, major in sports management. Yeah. So, love yeah. it. I, I used to remember sitting at. Um, so I used to pack all my classes into one day and it was generally a Wednesday or a Thursday. So I Absolute work. dream, eh? Oh, <laughs> yes, that's perfect. I was earning, you know, decent money and I was, you know, yeah. it was great. Absolute win. Um, but I still remember I'd, I'd rock up at nine o'clock on the train and I'd leave at nine o'clock that night and I should walk along, you know, that really long walk to get back to um, MacArthur Station. I don't because I drove every uh, single time, but so I, you I, know, the, I know where it is. You were the guy I would have scabbed the lift off if I'd known. But, yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. That's how I met another guy. Is like, well, you're the only guy from the Shire. That's, <laughs> that's how we became friends. Awesome. <laughs> I remember um, sitting at the station and it was just like it was like attack of the giant rats, and there were like rats this long. Wow. Really? Rats. Yeah, at the station. Awesome. Sorry, it was awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. Wow. the best. Yeah, and so you'd see like a, a Macca's packet just sort of moving around. I'm like, <laughs> why is it moving? And then all of a sudden you see this giant head crawl out. Yeah. Like, right. Oh my gosh! It's like they breed them different down there. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, because there wasn't many people at the station, so there's just rats that is everywhere. Amazing. Yeah, it was dead at night. They were oh legit. yeah, because you're saying it's nine o'clock at night too. Yeah, at least wow. the, the largest one I saw was about two foot. So wow, yeah, it was awesome. 
That's the best. Yeah, it was like miniature cats. The cats got scared and ran. <laughs> ah, that's amazing. Because yeah. we've talked about uni a fair bit on the podcast yeah. and how my experiences was I worked full time and then went to uni mm. and I wish I'd never done that. I wish I'd just kept working because I feel like uni made me lazy. But then we talked about it also gave us freedom to do like youth ministry and stuff too. So it kind of worked out. Well, I suppose my question, the reason I bring that up is like, what did you decide to do after uni? Um, I went straight into work. <clears throat> so I, I worked all through uni as everyone does in retail, got out and managed to get a, um, like a entry level role at Johnson and Johnson, which was mm. good. Um, and I learned a lot of hard lessons there. Um, <laughs> so we need doesn't prepare you for full time work, does no, it? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's oh, it's about does. politics. Didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. What do you mean? I have to work a full eight hours. Like, why can't you slack off? <laughs> I got that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it <laughs> it's also challenging as well because you you it's a t- completely different environment for anything that you've done, mm. right? So. Like work lunches, best thing ever. But <laughs> I didn't realize you meant to go back to work after. <laughs> like, so it like- Oh, we just like keep talking? Yeah, can you just keep getting, nah, you gotta go back to work. But, but really? <laughs> I just had a schnitzel and I'm about to have a food coma. This yeah, I need to have a sleep. <laughs> yeah, this isn't gonna work for me. Um, so you learn a lot of hard lessons there. And- <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like about food and sleep. That's Pretty good. much, yeah. Um, so that was, that was good. Um, but you also learn, you, you learn from your mistakes. And I think, mm. you know, that, mm. that made me really, um, a much better kind of rounded person learning hard lessons. And yeah. we don't do that enough. I think we don't mm. get, get our kids to learn hard lessons. We protect them a bit, which is part of the conversation we're having before. But, yeah. um, I think that was really helpful for me. And then I spent, Spent sort of three years at J and J, and then I did a stint at Unilever, which was all right. I, that was where I discovered that um, uh, commutes were a problem. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Makes I was a lot harder. Oh yeah. man, like I was commuting from Sutherland up to um, Epping. Yeah, right. uh, every day in yeah. the car. I used to do uh, my first job out of uni was at a sports organisation, and they were in Olympic Park. So, mm. but I had to catch the train, mm. so it was. Killer. Originally, it was two hours each way. Mm. I was like, yeah, you understand that. <laughs> oh, mate, I get it. Like, it was one of those ones where if I got up, I got up at 5.30 and I'd leave at like half past six, right? Mm. Which is where my fondness for White Horse Coffee came from because they were the only place that were open at <laughs> 6.30. And I'd rock up. And if I wasn't on the road before quarter to seven, it was an hour and a half. Mm. If I was on the road before quarter to seven, um, it was 45 to an hour. Yeah. Like... It's a big difference. difference. It's a big difference, yeah. Yeah. And then what do you do in the car? And that's where I discovered podcasts. So I like I've listened to that many sermons and podcasts, and Mm. it's it's great. Like so, I I really enjoyed and valued that. And I think when I look back, God was teaching me by having that period of of time. Um, And in fact, that's that's when I sort of began to move, make the move and decision towards, you know studying theology um so i I signed up to smbc when i was at uh, unilever but Mm. um yeah the the commute back i still remember my worst commute back was gosh i got on the road at 4 30 on a friday afternoon and because there was a crash um i can never remember the specific name but you know where you have the y when you the y junction when you're coming down king george's road or from the Princess Highway and it yep. funnels in to go over Tom Uglies. Yep. There was an oh, accident yeah. on both sections at, at the advanced, like further up from the wire, which then <sighs> compounded with a, another accident that was in the wire junction. <sighs> Two and a half hours it took me to get home mm. on a Friday afternoon. I was about ready to murder someone. It <laughs> um, it's like when you used to, you know, even when I remember I used to work at Arncliffe and it was, if the trains weren't working, I used to drive home. Like it was just the both bridges coming back into the shire were just absolutely yeah. tanked. Yeah. 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 And I was in a little Mazda 323 with a manual and my clutch was gone by the oh, end yeah. of it. It was like, I was like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the manual in traffic is not, yeah, is not fun. Not fun. Uh, just before, oh, go, if you're going to ask a question. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there, Ethan. My apologies. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> this is my podcast. Yeah, you're running the show. You <laughs> Not really. The Chip Lord. I just <laughs> the Chip Lord. All the Chip hail Lord. His Majesty. This the guy Chip doesn't Lord. need. What's it called? 
Can't even think. Chicken salt. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't remember what it was called. Dave, can you can you find a chip crown and just put oh, it here, like the on his head? I've, I'm thinking of the um, you know, the little fries. Yeah, in, yeah from yeah. Um, McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, just like mm. a Macca's fries on my head, on your on the head. Yeah. Love it, poor Dave. <laughs> Spending hours Good trying luck. to animate that. <laughs> Individual chip at a time. Yeah. <laughs> we love you, Dave. Thanks for editing. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, though, I don't know when this happened, but uh, you went to Tonga. Yeah. On a missionary trip. When did that happen? All around this? Uh, so I left uh, July. Uh, it was actually August. I think it was August 8th or August 12th. One of the two, um, 2011. Um, and I came back sort of late July, I think July 30th in 2012. So was that after you went to SNBC? It was or during. <laughs> oh, during. All right, so let's <laughs> let's uh, go SNBC and then you can tell us the yeah, Tonga, yeah, yeah. The Tonga sure. missionary trip. What, at the same why time. SNBC? Yeah. Like why did you choose to do, um, not not necessarily that, <coughs> not why that place, but why why? I had a few people in my, my year at the time. Um, who <laughs> at Unilever? <laughs> um, no, um, in, in personal life. You really did hit up all the big uh, pharmaceutical brands. Yeah. Of Johnson yeah. & Johnson and Unilever. Is there, isn't, there's another one, isn't there? Um, yeah, uh, Wreck It Beckinser. So, oh, so when, I, got that one. when I came back from Tonga, I interviewed there, got a job there, but ended up going to McWilliams. So I could have done <laughs> three from three, but anyway. Um, SNBC, sorry. Yeah, so I, I had a few people in my ear who one of them was very um, anti-Moore. Um, and didn't really more want college, me to go to more college, mean. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I probably gave them a little bit too much um, sway in the, the decision-making process. I, in saying that, I also had other people saying, go to more, go to more. Mm. Um, so it was just more where I was at at the time. Um, I did feel like at the time the decision to give up full-time work and mm. you know work part-time and study full-time and live in Newtown was probably not the decision for me that I wanted to make mm-hmm. um, just because of where I was in my life circumstances. So I was trying to look for a, a part-time study option. Mm. Um, I did a lot of research on a couple of the different places and I really enjoyed the, um, they call it interdenominational rather than um, yeah. anything else. Um, and I like that fusion of different learning backgrounds coming together and and different lecturers um i also really do think that everyone's on a mission um Mm. and whether your mission is here or overseas um you know all all christian Mm. life is a mission yeah Yeah, for sure i really i liked that idea um i kind of had in my head that i would go overseas at some point so i thought well it it sort of fits um and their part-time options were great so um i learned that the (laughs) so uh, 40,000 foot sort of view. My my part-time degree took nine years. Um, when I was, I started at SNBC, when I moved over to Tonga, I had to do it by correspondence. But because SNBC didn't offer correspondence, I had to do it through um, Melbourne School of Theology. So I did um, a certain number of subjects through there. Then when I came back to SNBC, I was both uh, doing Melbourne School of Theology. Is that the same as Ridley? Ridley? Yeah, I think yeah. it's the old Ridley, yeah. yeah okay. Melbourne School of Theology and SNBC classes at the same time. So crossing over, it was very weird. Yeah. Um, and then um, I spent um, sort of years doing SNBC. Mm. I, I got to the maximum amount of time <laughs> it could take to do a <laughs> course. So, so if you've got to, if you, you, you're, taking, you're taking ages to do it, and so it must be really important that you want to do it. Why, why, why do theological training? Like what triggered that? Um, what made you want to do it? My initial thought was I really wanted to kind of go into full-time ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt like I had a, a good skill set that God could use in an environment like that. Um, I really value what ministers do and pastors do in the environment. I believe that they have a pretty difficult job. I also think that then there's sort of sometimes needs to be people from different walks of life get involved in ministry and in pastoring. And I felt like my background and my history um, qualified me to be someone that could understand and mix with different people groups, Mm. I think is probably the best way to describe them. Um, And I felt like that would be a great sort of journey for me to go on. Mm -hmm. Um, I also deeply value academic 
foundation should grant you the opportunity to, to be more effective um, in some of the skill sets that you use. So yeah. I, I really like learning and then taking what I've learned and applying that. So that's sort of my <laughs> bent. <So> um, <laughs> too much chicken salt. Please, please continue. <laughs> Sorry, man. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, you're right. Um, so that was sort of the, the reason. I feel like it has um, given me a fantastic understanding of things that I didn't consider mm. in my Christian walk. Yeah. Um, I also really value learning how to do certain things mm -hmm. well. Um, I really valued learning how to properly write essays, which is something I didn't do at <laughs> university. Um, that is going to sound boring to people, but um, I love the idea of a constructed argument and written form is fantastic. Oh, and I also think like, I think, yeah, it's, it's very easy to make that sound boring. Like, yeah. But, um, but it's, I think it's really important to like come out of something like that, like a, like a, like a, like a degree that is a lot of essay writing and mm. stuff like that um, with the ability to like, it's teaching you, to, it's teaching you to form an argument. It's not just teaching you to write an essay. It's going, how do I in a conversation with someone yeah. or in a debate, of any kind or in a, like, it's not that you're, you're now better at arguing. It's now like, which I guess you may be, but it's actually, it's actually about that idea of, oh no, I can actually have a constructed thought mm. that is, that is cohesive and helpful and I understand it and I know how to present it. Yep. And yes, written form, but also you can, I don't know, you can talk in structures yeah. and you can, um, research properly and you can like I think that's all really really helpful whether you're doing a marketing degree or a theological degree or, mm. a, or a law degree like you may be getting it differently but I think it's really easy to be like oh essays are all because they are they suck but also like it's actually that is a really great takeaway yeah um, I think the thing that really trained me to do and this is something that I was not good at before mm. is you need to understand both sides of the argument in yep. an essay yep. um, and I feel like as a culture we've really lacked that mm. ability to sort of see someone else's perspective. Um, and I've found that in my conversations with people when I'm trying to evangelize, so to speak, um, if you just disregard people's mm. perspective, it, it is a, it's a great way to not be loving. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. yeah. And in fact, many people have many valid reasons for not being a Christian. Yeah. And those valid reasons need to be understood and engaged with. Yeah. Um, if you're any hope of, you know, being an instrument for God to help them mm. on their walk. Um, I, I really, really value that I had to learn a lot of things I disagree with, mm. um, particularly about other religions and other parts of the Christian fabric of theology. Um, that trained me really well. So I also then understood, I think, that in the process of that, that people, people are a story mm. more than they realize and actually understanding someone's story and being able to speak into that story and offset some of what they're saying with have you thought of this and mm. i wonder if when you look at that perspective you consider that kind of um, point um i found that that's really helpful mm. Mm. especially when speaking with non-christians who have had poor experiences with god mm. and i think or church yeah because i think you're totally right in that like a person's worldview and the things they think about and the things they love and feel and, yeah. and experience is because of that story that they are. Like uh, not just the story that they tell, but the story that they've experienced mm. and the story that they have lived through. And that was just my, for audio people, that was my... Oh, thanks for I just threw my coke away for and coke sprayed it everywhere. You didn't get that um, on the computer though. No, I also didn't get it over me. <laughs> it's just, just you, <laughs> sorry. Guys. Um, you winded the wall though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no? No. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh no! <laughs> I'm we're so de sorry. We're definitely I did as, the I did as well. much damage as I could possibly do. Um, <laughs> the that that really that really pulled me out of my very solid point yeah, about what you stories. Said was really good. It was really <laughs> enigmatic and interesting. Um, no, but but I think I was actually just trying to affirm you really and just mm. say that I'm that that's a really fantastic way of looking at um, looking at evangelism. I think it's a really cool way to 
um, when we when we talk about apologetics and we talk about mm. uh, and we talk about talking to people who don't believe the same thing, it's really easy just to be like, all right, what are the what are the talking points that we can counter? What are the what are the cultural worldviews or perspectives yeah. or things that we can have the answers to? And what are the um, mm. Yeah, the questions that we want to avoid or, or stuff like that mm. is really easy. But but at the end of the day, you're right. It comes down to what's that person's story mm. and how can Jesus fit in that? Yeah, which is why um, you said before, you're like contextualization is really important. 100%. 100%. Um, and, not, and not contextualization without truth of the bible like it's not it's not I, I i if i understood you correctly it was not changing the truth of the bible to contextualize it was going how can we present that yeah how can we present the gospel how, yeah. yeah how can we present the gospel in a way that people will um will react to in a way that is um, um helpful. helpful yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Helpful. yeah. Oh, when i when i was finishing the masters that i was doing one of the you, you have to do a project, which is a oh, fancy I thought you like you did another master's. No, no, no. Okay, no, right, no. it's part of it. I've maxed it too. I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I was doing the master's, there's a project at the end, which is about 8,000 words. It's a, it's a, essentially a very long essay. Yep. Um, and they, they, they want you to pick a topic that you're passionate about mm. um, that hasn't been contributed to and then walk through it. And the topic I discussed was that um, preaching in the Bible was always contextual. Mm. And that um, if you don't contextualize as a preacher, you're going to lose your audience. Very interesting. Um, and what I tried to show is that if you compare um, Peter during the uh, Pentecost and Peter uh, and then Paul at the Areopagus, yeah, yeah. Um, the way he talks about um, God in those two um, audiences is very mm. different. Mm. Yeah. Yet the truth is abundantly aligned. Yeah, because mm. the Greeks are like. Look at this guy talking about one God only, yep. right? Yep. Mm. Yep. Whereas and then the Jews are used to hearing about one God only. Yeah. Mm. And it's about how that God fits in their history and, and in their yeah. people and, and, in their, right. and in their customs um, versus how in the era of guess it was, it, it. it was that, it was that idea Papa of... Rica. <laughs> Papa Rica, <Rica. laughs> um, Yeah, it was that. Yeah. Look at your gods and look at how mm. my God has yeah. something better. He, Paul went on a logical approach. Yeah, it was, uh, whereas Peter went on a historiographical yep. approach. Okay. And yep. it was, it's fascinating. Mm. And that's how people in the area, I guess, would talk. They would, the whole thing is you rock up there and yeah. you talk about logic and you talk about ideas and you talk mm. about thoughts and you talk about um, philosoph phil philosophies. And Paul knew that. And so he did that. He talked mm. about logic and philosophies and ideas. Yeah. Um, and then he just went, look at Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Pretty much. Mm. Give or take. I was going to ask you though, Drew, did you end up doing any ministry after you? Mm. Finish the um, course. Yeah, so I, I, um, I suppose I, I did a little bit of preaching and mm -hmm. teaching at um, a couple of churches, which was mm. which you've also done here. Mm. Yeah, which I've I've done here. Um, I've probably been more active here than oh, anywhere okay. else. Yeah. Um, you preached on Sunday. Yep, I did. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. which was um, preached on Esther, which again is a story, mm. and um, I love Old Testament narrative. It's yeah. it's it's so rich and. Um, colourful in mm. the sort of insights that it can give you into life. Yep. Uh, yeah. But I did a little bit at St. John's, I did a little bit at Menai. Um, I led a couple of Bible studies. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, when I was in Tonga, um, part of, and I suppose we'll get into more detail, but it's a good mm. segue. Yeah, yeah, it's a great yeah, segue. Yeah, yeah, um, Let's go for it. So the, the, the whole gig with that is, um, <laughs> or deal with that is, uh, the, the, Tonga is an interesting nation where it's um, very, very much a Christian nation. Mm. Um, and when you arrive there, there's three main, main churches. There's uh, uh, the um, Wesleyan Church, the Free Church of Wesley, and uh, the Mormons. Uh, and okay. the, the two first ones sound very um, much the same. But, <laughs> but essentially, it's the same church that schismed, I don't know, 60 years before I arrived. And um, the church, the Wesleyan Church, um, runs a lot of the education system over there so about 30 percent of the schools are run by the free wesley uh, are run by the wesley church um their business ventures consequently pay for that education so it's a little bit of a circle where mm. the people buy from a store and then the profits go back into the, fr the church and then the church funds the, cool. the education system and so on and so right. forth yeah cool um unfortunately i had some uh, <laughs> democratic issues shall we say where um they had a little bit of a riot in 2006 and um, whoopsie burnt down some buildings oh, no. um, <laughs> whoopsie. those those buildings just happened to be the ones that the the church needed to um 
have revenue coming into the coffers. Oh, okay, oh, right. No. Uh, so the the long and the short of it was um, China, in its sort of diplomatic ways, decided that they would donate some money to mm. not donate but loan some money to mm. to Tonga, and um, the church applied for a loan um, and decided to build back one of the buildings to obviously bring in an income, and they needed someone to do some business management for it, and I was young and um, willing and mm-hmm. went over there and sick. It was um, challenging. I was way too young from the perspective of no one listened. Uh, right. So I didn't have enough gray hair. That was what yes. I discovered my big problem was. Mm-hmm. Um, I also discovered about two, three months in that there was no way that they could pay off the loan. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. we're sort of telling the mission organization, I think you need to send someone over here. A, a not listening to me and B, they're in frightful trouble. Yeah. Um, so they sort of sent someone over uh, but by the end of it I'd drawn up a business plan marketing plan yeah, awesome. um, and sort of fixed everything that I could fix mm. and then um, ran out of things to do but decided to stay on for another six months <laughs> and um, live on a tropical island because you know who, who wouldn't yeah. <laughs> and um, as sort of that six month mark for me was coming up just before I decided to stay the, the, the small church that was there which was like a little um, expat church uh, everyone who'd been there for years and this is Tonga to a T just went oh we're going for a little while can you just watch the place and I'm just sitting there going okay so I basically picked up the Bible study and all the preaching and everything I was treasurer as well so it was so cool like I was <laughs> playing with the money it was, it was great um, and um, yeah they basically said yeah yeah you're running the show and then yeah, right. I just did that for the next six months until Blimey. they all decided to come back and did you preach in English or you preached in I preached in English because it was expat so yeah, okay, yeah so sorry. it was basically a kaleidoscope of um, poms and yanks and kiwis and a couple of Aussies <laughs> I like um, how you, you didn't call them by their like American name, you, you just like call them like, all like Australian nicknames. Poms, Aussies, Kiwis. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And um, <laughs> yeah, so it was good because like the church got pretty small for a while, but mm. it, it humbled me in many senses because like at some point I was preaching to three to five people and yeah, you're like, like mm. anyone looking from the outside in is like, why are you doing this? Mm. Um, what's the point? And to me, I was like, actually, the point is that people are turning up and yeah this is really good for my heart because it's it's showing me that actually it's not about you know the lights and the you know lights camera action you know it's yeah. about actually preaching the gospel yeah preaching, preaching the, the gospel, gospel yeah it's all about um it also was really good because i knew roughly he would be in the surface every week yeah so i could hyper contextualize it to their lives <laughs> yeah so yeah. they'd all walk out going oh, i felt like you really were talking to him like <laughs> i was <laughs> <laughs> so it was like it was you know you can't do that here you know it's, Stu can't you know he's got 100 odd people in a sermon or 200 people you, you can't you know narrow it down to one person mm. but like <laughs> i got that chance it was pretty funny <laughs> um so that, that was cool and um yeah so at, at the end of it i i came home and um Walked out off the plane, froze to death, and rocked up to a job interview at McWilliams Wines the day after and <laughs> got the job. Wow, there you go. Yeah, and have been sort of peddling wine since. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> peddling wine <laughs> since. <laughs> a wine peddler. Um, so, that was the, that, was that where you planned to come back and just I get a job like that? As well. yeah. Right. So, like, I could have gone for another visa. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't. I think the right thing to do. Mm. I think I needed to come home. I think I'd learned what I was going to learn. Um, mm. And I think staying there, it was either going to be a 15 year jaunt or it was going to be a sort of come home. Like a 15 year yeah. jaunt. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's, it's actually a seductive lifestyle. Like I, my, my commute was a seven minute um, bike ride when I was commuting. Mm. Um, you, you can live off, three to five thousand dollars australian fairly easily um like per year or per year <sighs> and that i mean that's pretty baseline mm, we mm. i tried to live a bit higher than that so yeah, i wasn't eating you know a barbecue chicken each night from the, <laughs> the local barbecue store um but it's it's a seductive lifestyle because it's it's warm mm. um it, there is that cultural element where you know the the, the barlangi which is what the they call Westerners. It does get treated a little bit different because that's life in the Pacific. Mm. Um, you know, 
I, uh, at the end, I, I tried to think, what am I going to be doing long term? And if I'm going to sit here and do this, it has to be this. And then yeah. you, you're forfeiting your ability to build, you know, a life in Australia. Mm. Um, I don't miss the medical um, system. <laughs> they do need help there. I've, I've heard that it's since gotten better, but uh, it, it is a challenge. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was something I never thought I'd do. Um, but once I did it, I'm like, ah, oh, I, I get this. I really get this. I get why Michos are passionate about it. Mm. Um, you do see things so super clear. You see things. It, it's like it's like you've got a different set of glasses on mm, different perspective yeah. and the the six months when you come back as well you're like hypersensitive to everything that westerners are doing wrong in culture in a, shock yeah of your the, own culture yeah yeah you you see your own culture in a massively different light and like the extravagance that we live here and the waste that mm -hmm. we live here is phenomenal but you then get very used to it slowly mm. over time and mm. eventually just that that whole sense leaves you in one one way or another so yeah and so sorry the place you moved to is wine like so when you got that job that's a wine yeah, distributor it's, it's a wine it, mcwilliams is a wine business oh, so mcwilliams to, sorry. Yeah, yeah it used to sure. um it used to be a family-owned wine business that sold its own wine to different um retailers like endeavor mm -hmm. drinks which is bws and their Murphy's oh, right. yep. or cole's liquor um i was there for a couple of years and then got headhunted over to endeavor liquor which is the largest national chain of um uh, uh drinks i guess you'd call them mm. and um i spent six years there and then um got headhunted and went over to perno ricard which was an interesting time um that was a uh, very big learning experience for me uh, and then i sort of six months in decided i wasn't really cut out for corporate life anymore and um handed in my regs resignation at 12 months and went out and did my own thing and i'd like to say i haven't looked back since but the reality it's it's you know you even even though i've got a lot more f freedom to do certain things it's brings all sorts of different difficulties mm. um, and you're much more a um a leaf on the on the tide of the market and when that is a bumpy market um you feel every bump uh, whereas big big ships can kind of just carve through it a bit easier. How is that like, I suppose my question is that as a Christian, like first of all, going into business on your own, but then also when you have to ride those big bumps, like you're talking about that are present for a small business, especially what does, um, how does that help being a Christian? How, be, how does being a Christian help in those scenarios? Um, it gives you someone to cry to. <laughs> um, that's always helpful. Mm. Um, I think there is um, a real opportunity for for church and churches to um, uh, engage with those people in those environments a little bit more. And, and that's not to say, that's not pointing finger at solos or anyone. That's more, I think there's a lot of learning there that we could all do together, which would benefit everyone. Um, because in terms, of, in terms of what? Because I think what it teaches you is that um, you are much more at God's will than you realise. Mm. And that is one thing I've learned. Very often, things will happen and there's no reason for them, except that there's a, I feel, divine intervention in what's going on in my business life, um, which is a strictly um, offensive thing to say to a business person because um, they believe that they're the masters of their own destiny. There's a lot of like self-made kind of vibe. I'm not, I'm not self-made in the sense of um, I, I'm, I very much believe everything I'm being gifted in yep. my businesses is from God. Yeah, and, and your skills and abilities and all yep. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, like the the entrepreneurial thoughts that I have are all God's, not mine. Mm. Um, so it becomes easier in one sense to ride waves, knowing that God's on either side. Um, it doesn't help with the sick feeling in your stomach yeah. when something goes you're wrong. You're still riding it. <laughs> yeah, you're still riding it for sure. Um, but you begin to realise that even if you are a little leaf, um, you're a little leaf that God has control over. And that is much more comforting than you think at your darkest times. Yeah. I find the trick is, is when things are going well, 
it's really easy to forget that as well. I find it really hard to, um, I find it really hard in general to remind myself to thank God. Yeah, I and think I, it's a struggle for everyone. Yeah, um, and I try to keep thinking that I'm only able to do a lot of these things because of God, and and pushing that into the front of my mind. You know, uh, you know, not that I think God sits there and and, and plays with you like a toy, but I do think that the experience has been one that God has pointedly said to me, I'm in charge, you're not. And I just need to keep remembering that. Yeah. And as I keep remembering that, the good and the bad becomes a little bit less important mm. because end of the day, you know, what am I doing? Serving God, feeding my family. Mm. I'm, you know, trying to live a godly life. They're the only things that matter. Um, Have you seen like... You, you talked before about like your inte- integrity is really important. And I think as Christians, it is a really important thing to p- focus on. Have you seen in running your own business that pursuit of integrity uh, work out well for you or even just impact someone else that's not used to them to seeing that level of integrity? Um, I think so in the sense that like, so for instance, I took on a contract once where um, – I didn't feel towards the end that I was delivering on what I was being paid to do. Mm-hmm. And I actively canned the contract and I felt like it meant that the relationship I had with the person would persist down the track, even though I wasn't able to deliver what he wanted. The fact that I said, I'm calling it, I'm not, I'm not actually helping you. I'm, I'm not able to do what you're not delivering it. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think that made a difference to him that he felt like I, actually did have the best interest for his business Mm. um it also changed failure in the sense of even in failure you can succeed by actually holding to christian principles Mm. and teach people that um for argument's sake if you're not delivering on something you can still go about it the right way rather than take the mickey Mm. um so there's that i think um it's increasingly different to be a christian in business now more than ever I think when you like for instance if you're paying someone and you're paying them above ward and doing things the right way a lot of people can be taken aback by that i think like if you're paying on time paying on time is is a good one (laughs) um you know especially when you're not getting paid on time (coughs) i was gonna say savings and pay someone else yep um i think um on one of the small ventures that i've got i I deal in a, a, a relatively fraught part of the market and um, the person I'm working with is remote and he and I are basically partners in what we're doing. And I think he's a little bit shocked by how transparent I am and the, the, mm. like what, what responsibilities and um, privileges I'm happy to just kind of say y- you're in charge of that. And yeah, take that over. Yeah. Because that's, yeah, that's not my strength. Yeah. Um, and I've found that that works really well for us because um, I, don't, I don't question – for instance, the finances that he's moving between things, I don't question it at all. I just, I just trust that he's doing the right thing. And I found that he's really transparent. As a consequence, he comes forward and says this or that mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Because you're exhibiting that behaviour as well. Yeah, and that makes me proud because I feel like, because I know he's not a Christian, I feel like I'm giving him the best re- reason to at- rethink his position. Mm. Um, and I think that's all I can do. I think differently too, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So I think they're the positives. Um, I am seeing that it's very difficult to politically manage your business in a um, hashtag work environment where um, there's a lot of different views flowing around about things. Um, I've so far avoided a lot of that. I just kept my head down. But some of the contracts I've got... Um, like a big one that I've got at the moment with Pinnacle Drinks, it's 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 everywhere there. Mm. And they ask you to join in and like for instance I'm doing a project for the loud and proud and so they're the positions that you get get put in and mm. how do you know. stand how do you stand over what you believe as a Christian? But um, also but like you're yeah. also contracted to a business to deliver a particular service, right? So yeah. that's that sounds like it's a really difficult thing yeah. to to balance. And I've also had to do the kind of um, thinking through of, um, you know, 
in in doing projects like that, what are you actually supporting? Well, mm-hmm. you're actually not supporting anything either way. It's like um, any of the projects I'm doing, I don't support per yeah. se. It's that I'm doing work that brings a project to life. Yeah, I think so. And gives them the ability to mm-hmm. do whatever they want with mm-hmm. it. Um, and in that sense, it's their statement that they're making, not mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I, I've begun to think through a lot of those things. I think um, there are certain battles and certain things you should dig your heels in on. Um, I just think sometimes as Christians, we don't always get what that is right. And mm. I think there's certain things we should be rethinking how we engage with. Um, and then there's other things where we've gotten it right and dig in more. Mm. Um, they're really difficult um, topics, I think, because I don't believe the dialogue from an inter-Christian perspective is happening. Um, I think we as, as a ch- wider church could be talking more about how do we deal with these challenges how do we deal as a collective wider group Mm. Um, because if you start to get the teachers and the people who are sort of ministers and stuff in a room discussing things it helps them to work it out and then that then flows through the rest of the congregation a little Mm. bit more i find Um, that's the one thing that i've i think from an observer's point of view in a business environment, we, we don't necessarily get right. So well, That's interesting. Um, well, I've, before I ask you the final question, let's just tell us about your family because you have quite a large family. <laughs> 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 yeah, and yeah. there are particular reasons for that, obviously, but um, it would be better for you to tell us like how that <laughs> ended yeah. up happening and, and why... <laughs> How many actually? How many kids are in your family now? I have six. Yeah, that's quite yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, I don't sleep, um, <laughs> yeah. as you can tell by the bags under my eyes. Um, <laughs> actually, looking all right today. Huh? Oh, well, I was just looking goodness. then. I'm like, yeah, you're yeah. All right. The uh, foundation must. You be I was going to say you put yeah, makeup yeah, yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so I am married to Tina. Uh, we um, got married in 2019, and um, we're both on our second marriage. We we, we sort of divorced from previous um, partners. Um, she had three kids to her previous husband and I had one um, kid to my previous wife uh, and all four of those were girls. <laughs> um, so when joining it together, um, it was a, a giant squeal of happiness. Yeah. Um, and we decided that rather than um, sleep and, and you know go on adventures, we would decide to have a few more kids. I was saying you've had two more, right? Yeah, we've had two more. Um, so we had little Serafina, who mm. is um, nearly two, and she's an absolute delight. Um, and she squeals like a yeah. like a happy little kid. Mm-hmm. So she's got that great energy and, mm. and vivaciousness, which is what you want. Um, and then we've got little Jesse, who's uh, nearly six months old, um, and he is a wonderfully smiley little boy, um, who we're hoping will eventually sleep through the night. And that, would be, um, that would be positive. It would be very positive for <laughs> everyone involved. Um, it so is positive when it happens. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, it'll happen. He's a good kid. Like he, he's just obviously <laughs> yeah. going yeah, through that learning curve of what it is. Where to, is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, be awake and um, <laughs> find out what it is that the nightlife is. Mm-hmm. And uh, so yeah, so we've got six. We have a um, a care carnival which gets all kind of <laughs> loaded up. A bus. A bus. Yep. Um, <laughs> a bus. So my little run around is, is still with me because obviously for work. But yep. um, yeah, we can't fit hardly any of them. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, so we have a big family. Um, mm. We have our own unique challenges. Um, mm. So we, we, we have a kind of a perspective where um, halves don't count. You round up and treat everyone like they're the, the same. Um, so everyone's equal and square in our family. Mm. Um, we uh, do enjoy... The, I think seeing them bond and mm. seeing, and I, I suppose other parents who are listening to this who had have older kids and then have had a couple of younger kids will, will understand this, but seeing your older kids um, uh, find joy in your younger kids. Look mm. after them. And, yeah. yeah, and the relationship that they're building. Like when the girls come home from school, so we, we don't exist to Serafina. She's just poof, gone. Yeah. Awesome. And they mm. love her and she loves them. Yeah. And that's really lovely. Mm. And that, that, that is a real parenting thrill for me. Mm. Um, so I really enjoy that and, 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 and learning how to, how to navigate that 
mm. that situation is, is, is one that I'm enjoying at the moment. So how old's the oldest? It goes 14, 12, 10, 9, nearly 2, nearly 6. 6, six months. 6 yeah. months. Yeah, 6 months. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it, there's a there's a gap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we were, we, we were, it was like it was like snakes and ladders, and we got all the way up, and then we hit a snake and went all the way back down. <laughs> yeah. Had to start again. yeah, yeah, yeah. So quality. Cool. Yeah, I I'm I'm a I'm six years older than my brother, and that's not as big a gap as as any of them actually. But um, but I think that that was that was a real. It's been a real privilege growing up with him, mm. and actually. Like only just then, like I'm 24 and Eli just turned 18. And it's like, oh, this is really cool. I've got him. Like my friend who's been my little friend is now- My big friend. Like my big friend and it's yeah. great. Like, um, and it's really cool to, um, like I think I assume mum and dad have enjoyed watching that friendship happen and grow. Yeah, absolutely. And like, um, and like I, a lot of the cultural stuff I'm aware of I'm aware of because I've been with Eli for so like for so long and he's influenced me as much as I've influenced him. And mm. um, yeah, it's really beautiful to see that. And that's definitely not on the scale <laughs> that your girls and boy are working on, but, um, but it is, but it's really beautiful to see. Mm. And I'm really stoked that you're able to see that and you're getting to see that and that they're getting to see that. Like, yeah, I think also that the fact that they're growing up in a Christian household is yeah. just really lovely. Super lovely. I like the idea of that too. And I'm, I'm assuming that, the older kids, they go off to their yeah. So at certain um, times, yeah, they have certain times where they go back to yep. their respective mm. others, mm. and and that's that's um, a joy for us as well. <laughs> if there is break. one small <laughs> silver lining into this whole thing, the holidays are a lot quieter for us. Um, and yeah. I know that um, not everyone will will think this, but when it's down to only two for Tina and I, it feels like none. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Right>. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It would. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I've got three, and I'm like. Um, this is enough. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like to double that number, that'd be really tough. Yeah. How does, um, I always like to ask parents on this podcast, like what has God taught you about being a parent? Oh, a lot. Yeah. Um, so um, you realize what your parents haven't done when you become a parent mm. and then you can take that and that you can really learn good point. what God has done Mm. that you always crave man that's really good that's very cool well done drew keep going <laughs> but no, that's really helpful for me as well um i also think that you get the chance to you get the chance to explore with your kids their journey mm. um and you don't realize the impact that has on the kids mm. per se. Um, you mean as a Christian? Yeah, it? as yeah. a Christian, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So um, I like incidental, incidental moments mean more to kids, I think, than, than adults necessarily understand. Mm. But I feel like what the Bible has taught me is whilst there is an overarching narrative, there are incidental moments in the Bible which are pivotal. For example, the, the story that I mentioned before, you know, the whisper on the, on the wind or the, you know, Jesus on the cross or, mm. you know, um, Abraham and Isaac, those incidental moments are kind of pivotal. And what it taught me is that um, quantity time leads to quality time. Mm. Yep. So, if I keep spending time with my kids and I'm present in as much as I can be in a mm. responsible way, um, there will be things that will happen that mean more to them than I'll ever know. Um, and God has taught me that they're the moments for me to look for um, and they're the moments for me to make sure that you don't drop the ball. I'm going to drop the ball, but <laughs> yeah. try not to drop the ball. Yeah. Um, and that's been super important for me because, um, you know, one of the good things that I did have it was my parents were, were around, but I felt like they weren't at those pivotal moments where mm. I, I really was looking to engage. Um, whereas 
And that, that taught me to look at the Bible and go through and, and try to understand what, what was that that I was missing from, from them and that I find in God. And that now I'm able to kind of play that down into my kid's life. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I'm really proud of that Tina and I have with all of our kids is they talk. Um, and, you know, they talk about, more, more to Tina because obviously they're girls, but they, they talk more about important, yeah. difficult things. Um, and we've tried really hard to make our house a, um, uh, a no judgment zone from the perspective of we have standards, like he behavior standards, with it, all those things. But um, we really impressed on them that if something happens and you tell us, we're okay with that. We're going to listen yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. What we, what we don't want is you to not tell us. Mm. And in fact, that's when there will be, have to be consequences because yeah. deceit isn't something that we think will be helpful for you and it's not great for our ability to parent you. Mm. Um, so ke keeping and fostering that ongoing dialogue we think is really helping them navigate some extremely difficult cultural friendship issues that is going on now that are foreign to me, foreign to mm. you, mm. foreign because th this is high school, yeah. right? Yeah. This is the world of TikTok and, um, you know, Insta everything. Mm. And like some of the cultural undercurrents that are happening at the moment, and again, I do the whole hashtag wokeism thing, but it's more than that, mm. are really hard for, for kids to navigate. Yeah. So who are they talking to to find yeah. the um, advice to deal with those issues? Yeah. Now, of course, they're going to talk to their friends, but their friends aren't always going to be the best sources of wisdom. And this is where the... Stu, you're going to love this. This is where the shock absorber comes in. Yes. Help them to understand the wisdom of what you can impart, but yes. to shape that yeah. to the situation. That and you're in. helping them translate those mm. situations through a biblical lens. Yep. And that's, I mean, like we've talked about, um, Braden and I grew up in a non-Christian family, but Ethan obviously being Stu's son grew up in a Christian family mm. and how he really appreciated having things happen at school and be able to come home and have the ability mm. to first be listened to, but then translate that mm. through, a, like we said, a biblical lens. And that's what I love hearing. That's why I asked the, the question about parents. Mm. They come on this podcast, everyone that comes on this podcast is a Christian, but also... I really um, am, what's the right word, like really love hearing or knowing that my children, for example, are going to grow up in a Christian environment mm -hmm. and that will have impact on their lives and also their children's lives. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're gen making generational changes because of what Jesus has done on the cross, yep. right? And I think that's what really excites me about being a parent as a Christian, Yeah, that yeah, the thing that you said also is like it highlights what you perhaps needed as a as a child and that you can give that to your children mm. but also like the great things that your parents did give you already and then uh, god's god's at work and all of that right mm. but it's just that's just exciting so i, I really like what you're what you um, said about that i think also sorry just as a <laughs> as an addition as not a parent um <laughs> but as someone who can talk into that I have been that kid that's grown up in a in the yeah. Christian environment. I think, um, I think it, it it makes me think back to what you were saying before about other people just being like we're all we've all we're all stories, um, mm. and mm. in all good stories and in all stories there are moments, um, and um, being there for people in those moments mm. is really mm. important. Yeah. Um, and I think even even as a like. Whether it be whether it be as a parent, whether it be as a member of a church, like if it's and and whether it's been a, a parent being able to go, well, I actually can't talk to my kids about all this because oh, suddenly they're sixteen and they've gone mm. like all this stuff I've done to get them to talk to me, like what's 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 happened, like that. I've had conversations with parents where that has been yeah, the case. Yeah. Um, that's all I'm talking about there, um, <laughs> and it's that. Um, What's really cool is that as the community we've got in this, this shock absorber yes. vibe, yeah. is that we can all try and talk into those moments. Um, but at like, for example, a youth group, I only see them on a Friday night for a few hours. Yeah, you can only do so much. And so 
like it's so beautiful and so important that you guys as parents are talking mm. into uh, and being Christian influencers in the lives yeah. of your kids because like we will help <laughs> yeah. as much as we possibly can. Um, and we will be there when we can be there, um, which is as much as we will try to be there. Um, but you're not their parents. But we're not their parents. Mm. And it's so important and so beautiful that you're able to and that you're actively trying mm. to uh, build that culture in your family yeah. of talking to other one another and sharing your stories and sharing your moments and uh, being there for one another in those moments and in those stories. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm really encouraged by that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also like it is hard for parents, I think, because it's so easy to get um, mistake attitude for lack of engagement. Yeah. And um, like one of my daughters who shall remain nameless, I was driving <laughs> somewhere and I always make a point to ask how they're going mm. um, because when you're in the car, they're, 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 that's where those incidental moments can yeah. come in. Yeah. And I got, a, I got what I thought was a typical response and then you could kind of feel that she was thinking about whether she would say more and then she did and she mm. talked about something which she trusted me with, yeah. which was great. And then I got out of the car and I was like, that was a moment for her, like mm. where they thought they could go past the standard sort of point and engage with me at a, at a level which was different yep. to normal. Uh, and that being able to validate her in mm. what she was saying and, and help her to feel okay was really powerful, I think, for her mm. and made her feel better. Yep. And then... So I tuck that one away and I go, well, that's, that's really quite precious for me because mm -hmm. they're the moments where you go, ah, okay, I am getting through. Mm. <laughs> it's just that you have 99 incidents where they don't respond <laughs> yeah. and the one that they do is, is you know, are you going to ask a question? And I think um, that's hard. A lot of parents, I think, get discouraged and sometimes don't go back to the world because their emotions are hurt too. Like yeah. we, th we, we, we have to think and remember that parents do get hurt by their kids it's, it is hard. Mm. We're still, we're, they're still sinful. Yeah. Just like we are. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and in fact, that's a really important point to drive home. They are sinful and they're going to be, um, I nearly said a word, but they're going to be those things that we um, don't like. Um, so that's, that's one part. The other part that are, I think the Bible has taught me a lot, um, and this is ironically through a blended family, is that what adoption means. Mm. Um, mm. I yeah, really never cool. thought I could love kids that weren't biologically connected like they were biologically connected until I had that experience mm. and now I've got three that I love <laughs> like they're my own flesh and blood yeah and that's that's amazing because it it really does change all of that literature in the bible of adoption what does that actually mean and I think f for a lot of people we don't always get that gift to to feel that um and i just i wish i could translate that to other people so that they could get that concept of what it is to be adopted by mm. god as father um because it's such a beautiful feeling mm. um having now been able to to go through it and do it for a few years so that that's one thing that god has taught me a lot about through parenting is it you know that adoption element it's, it's pretty cool I, yeah i really value wisdom on this stuff i really learn a lot from that so thank you for answering that question That's right. in such a wis, wis, wisdom 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 way. Wisdomous. <laughs> it's not the word but it's funny we'll go with it wisdom wisdom i like that wisdom <laughs> it's like wisdom but with a u <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> final question yeah before we wrap it up um, and if you can hear lots of children, that's they're all here at Sorrel Bible Church with Fuse, which is our year five and six group. So what was that look for? What you just gave me the biggest side eye when you said Fuse? Did I? I didn't yeah. mean to. I'm like, are you, are you vibing what I'm saying? Yeah, that's yeah, all you're I'm right. Yeah, yeah, but I'm yeah, just yeah. letting you know that sometimes when we're recording ship lunch, Fuse is on in there the is, other room. And that's why. Yes. Well, we just want to celebrate the the kids yeah, that are coming along. So hundred percent the crew. I don't like. Let's call them crew, not kids. Uh, final that. question. What do you wish you knew now that you're a little bit older that you wish you knew when you were a younger Christian? Good question, eh? Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how much can I say and how much can I not? Um, I 
I would encourage every young Christian to know themselves more. Mm. And I know that sounds all preachy in 21st century, um, but I actually mean it in a different way. Um, your, you, as in younger Christians, are growing up in a really dynamic, different, challenging environment. Um, and I think all young Christians grow up in a similar melting pot of craziness. Hmm. Um, I think if I had had a better chance to, and I'm presuming here because this is, this is always a hypothetical, but I think if I'd had a better chance to understand who I was, I would worry less about what others thought mm. and worry more about what God thought. Mm. Yep. And I know that sounds so cliched, but um, there's a genuine meaning behind this. Um, so I've, I've long believed that um, what sin does is it disintegrates you. And what I mean by that is as a person, it pulls you apart, makes you different people to different places and locations, blah, 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 blah. Mm. Um, and consequently, you don't actually act as your natural normal self, the yeah. one who God created. So you repress certain things that shouldn't be repressed and you um, enunciate certain things that potentially you should leave a little bit more muted. Mm. Um, I think a lot of Christian kids... Um, need to understand what are the great, beautiful qualities of who they are um, that potentially the world will shout down on or mm. say things about and force them to reconsider whether they show that part of themselves mm. because it's sensitive. Um, I wish I knew that more about myself now uh, <laughs> back in the, in the day because it's not that I would think I would have made less mistakes, but I would have felt more secure mm. in who I am. Mm. and I think mistakes are great to make when you're in a safe environment um, I think not being yourself even if it is a safe environment is a terrible place mm. to, to, to sort of try and live um, and, and working through all of those challenges that of who am I and what is that supposed to mean um, I think potentially we let too many other people tell us who we are instead of actually seeking that out for ourselves mm. and, and seeking that out with a mind to the Bible yeah with God yeah. What, yeah, what he's given us. Yeah. Um, a lot of people um, pretend and they do it out of fear and it's an understandable fear, such an understandable fear. They, they, they want to be loved and accepted by the people around them and so they do things and become people that they aren't actually. Mm. Um, and I want to reassure anyone listening to that pod, the podcast that might hear this that um, who God crafted you to be is a beautiful and wonderful creation. Mm. You were perfectly and wondrously made. Mm -hmm. And um, when it feels like that person isn't good enough, um, take a step back, go and talk to someone you trust in a trust in, in an environment where you can take a few hours mm. and actually work it out. Yeah. Um, you know, speak to Ethan's, speak to the different people mm. around pray, that. Pray can, about pray, it. Yep. Pray about it. Um, speak because um learning that that person that god crafted um and thought of all those years ago um is so much more important to your future than you realize and mm -hmm. the sooner you begin to understand that about yourself um your life will take on different perspective and i really 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 wish i knew that as a kid mm -hmm. growing up because i was confused as to who i really was mm -hmm. um and i think i probably didn't really even sort myself out so to speak until i was in my mid-30s mm. um which is really not long ago because i'm only 38 um so that's terrifying like living mm. 30 something years not really fully comprehending who you are and having to go through mm. you know issue after issue uh, uncertain you know um that's that's what i wish i had done earlier is yeah. taking my time and actually zoned a lot of other stuff out and worked on myself um and worked out who I was. Mm -hmm. But I think the world makes that really hard and the mm -hmm. world is trying to tell you who you are rather than you develop that sense of it itself. Yeah, and I suppose that when we put our identity in Christ, and I think that helps mm. us to realise that that we don't have to be of... We can be in the world but not of the world That's and right. then we can see, like, God, what, what, what have you gifted me with? to be able to contribute to your church, 
to partner with you and tell me what I can do for you. Mm -hmm. And then he can re and reveal to me like the things that you want me to be doing or the gifts that you've given me and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I think like listening to that podcast, I, I can see listening to this whole, what you've said in this whole podcast mm -hmm. is I can see you've been doing that throughout your life. So <laughs> you mentioned before, um, two words like and I always try and come up with the the title of the podcast while the mm. <laughs> the podcast is going and I, I feel like it's going to be flourishing in wilderness because I feel like you've mentioned those two words but you've gone through lots of different things and you said that you were in the you talked about going to the wilderness kind of when you the first time you left church and all that kind of thing but also the flourishing bit is what you're talking about there is finding out what you're good at mm. and what you like and what where your identity sits under Christ and so and what the gospel means yeah. yeah and it's all through the the truth of the gospel right mm, yeah. is finding out what the your true identity in him is and i think that's been uh, really really encouraging um and even like talking about the wilderness stuff you you went to tonga for mm. a year yeah you um you worked at you went to uni you went to you worked at uh um what was it uni lever and johnson and johnson yeah. then you came back now you work in wine and you started your own business like you've got a blended family like there's all these <laughs> These mm. things that, the, and the situation that God's put you in, in order for you to flourish in His, mm. under His, under Him. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Final words, Ethan? No, that was, that was a lovely final words. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> thank you very much for your time, Ethan. But it's awesome. Most of all, thanks very much for your time, Drew. Yeah. Nice. Really, really appreciate it. It was a really fun podcast. Thank My you very pleasure, much. Chip Lord. Chip Lord. <laughs> 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 Let me put the chips on. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna get a crown by the by the end of this. The I feel like surely. there's got to be a McDonald's fry hat of some kind that we could find. The chip crown. The chip crown. The chip lord. Um, yeah, it's been awesome having you on, Drew. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, no we uh, always like to finish with a one way. So if you so wish to join us in a one way, absolutely, we'll do that. One way. Yeah.